Hi, I'm Captain Jack Springle with Team Shimano Sport Fishing, and I'm here today to talk to you guys about striped bass. And what else can I say to start it off? Striped bass are just one of the coolest fishes we have here in the country. In my personal opinion, they should probably be the national sport fish. They're striped like our flag. They're strong, they're resilient, just like our people. Uh, one of my favorite things about striped bass is just what they mean to so many different folks. Uh, for kids, they're the small fish under the dock in the marina. For purists, they're light tackle fly in the surf. For some of the most hardcore, they're out there standing on rocks. They're, they're a feature that comes in the middle of the night in the dark, smashes a plug, and you gotta hold on for dear life. For me, they're a technical, challenging sport fish in the upper Narragansett Bay, or they're down and dirty, heavy power lifters out in the deeper water fish in the ocean. Uh, it doesn't matter where you come from, fresh water, salt water, just about any part of the country, you've almost got access to this species. Here in the Northeast, predominantly where I fish, we're, we have some of the best striped bass fishing on the planet. And I'm excited to get into some of the little nuances that I've noticed about this species guiding for him for the last almost two decades now and some of the experiences I've had and I'm looking forward to share that with you today. Specifically up here in the northeast where we fish, I'm not talking about freshwater striped bass, I'm talking about saltwater bass. And to say saltwater bass, really I mean estuarine or brackish fish because they're by nature an andronomous species. That is to say they generally live their adult life in salt water but will migrate up into freshwater bodies and spawn. Uh, so because of that, they, we get to have a lot of different looks at them and we can target them in different environments. That comes down to basically backwater or big water for me. Backwater means areas where I fish in my hometown of Warwick and Rhode Island, where it's upper Narragansett Bay. It's an estuarine environment. Um, it was formed specifically by a large geographical formation of a glacier receding. And that same glacier receding created basically terminal moraine, which is just residue and, and deposits left behind from that glacier and that formed all of Block Island, Long Island, you name it. But the upper part of that punch, the backwater, or any of these large uh, estuarine rivers that we have up here in the northeast, those are the type of backwater environments we're talking about. When you get to the lower end of that, and once the season kind of winds on, the upper bays and the upper rivers get lower oxygen, their temperatures rise, these fish tend to move back out into the oceanic water and will start hanging around areas like Martha's Vineyard, Block Island, Block Island Sound, Montauk, and that's where we'll start targeting them in what I call big water. In addition to the fact that these fish are reacting to these different environments, you know, backwater or big water, it's really interesting to look at some of the charts of their migration and to see how this glacial deposit and all these islands and geographical features have actually influenced the way they migrate in and out throughout here in the Northeast. At a lot of talks I do, or no matter where I go, I always get asked questions, hey, can I see your numbers, or is there a magic spot? The truth is, there is no secret spot for striped bass. If there was a secret spot, by now the internet certainly would have ruined it. Uh, one thing that is important to pay attention to is your numbers, or a log, or pieces of information over the years. If you were to take a picture of my chart plotter, and look at just the upper regions of Narragansett Bay, the amount of numbers there would stagger you. And you'd see hundreds of numbers, but if you actually scrolled over and went on to each number, you'd notice that throughout the years, they were almost to the moon by that year in the same region, about miles and miles apart. But the point is, when I go out and guide every morning, uh, when I take clients out, no matter how many years I fish this body of water, I have to figure it out every morning fresh. And I have to use my network, I have to cover ground. The thing is, the striped bass are constantly on the move, they're constantly adjusting to their environment as well. So when it comes to locations, it's not just one spot that you're gonna focus on, it's their patterns, and how those patterns are related to things that happen with them, be that tide, be that changes in salinity, be that bait movement, and we'll get into each one of those. One thing you will notice about my numbers and how they've changed over the years is that there is general trends, specifically in the backwater areas like Upper Narragansett Bay where I fish. You'll find that most of these numbers are stacked along deep water channels, shipping channels that were dredged out, or just natural river basin channels from the original river that was there before the bay started. These fish will travel in that deeper water, able to control their temperature, and they'll utilize angles where they can have breaks in the current, and they're able to have an advantage feeding. So most of these numbers that I do have will be stacked along the edges of these channels at opportunistic points where they can feed. 
hands down, in my opinion, the most influential factor on targeting, locating, and catching striped bass, specifically up here in the Northeast, is current. Current is key. Uh, not just when the tide is, but how the tide is, how that tide influences bait, how it moves through a specific region can have a drastic impact on what you're doing. If you take a look at a specific region, uh, how that tide dumps out of there and the way it reacts to the geographical features will be completely different when that tide is inverse moving in. And appropriately, those fish will move and adjust their position within that current to give themselves the opportunistic moment to feed and also make it so that they're actually using less energy. The, one of the most important things to understand about a striped bass is they're not like a tuna. They don't have that long endurance. They don't have that all day sprinter stamina. They're power lifters. They have really big obnoxious tails, huge pectoral fins, large pronounced heads with large shoulder muscles. They're designed for quick bursts of powerful energy that they can use to make advantage of. So they're gonna sit behind current. They're gonna hide behind rocks. They're gonna bust out, take advantage of some kind of prey coming to them, and then they're gonna get back into that break from the current and not have to burn that energy. I mean, it's the basic rule of anything in nature is always take in more calories than you burn, you win at the end of the day. And that's basically the striper's goal at the end of the day. So when I first get out and I'm looking for fish, if there isn't a lot of tide, I'm generally covering a lot of ground. I'm serpentining with my boat, I'm using my sonar, or maybe I'm just throwing a plug up into shallow water I can't run in and trying to find out where these fish are. Generally, when there is not a lot of tide being influenced on these fish, they're spread out. They almost work like independent operators. They, you, know, you might find one here, you might find one there. You're going to try and get this general area where most of that life is happening. But when the tide starts to run, something special happens. As all that pressure and all that influence starts to get exerted on these fish, they tend to stack up, they get tighter. They get together and they're gonna all funnel down into one region where they're gonna be in a break. Maybe that's a spot in the canal, maybe that's a spot in the upper Narragansett Bay behind a hump, or that could even be a boulder out at Block Island. Point being, they're gonna all get influenced by the tide and they're generally just gonna get to this one area that is more comfortable. And that's when they're gonna be the most targetable and that's when they're gonna do most of their feeding behavior in general. So what I'm looking for is fish when they're being exacted current on them and they're going to be focused on one area where they can have a break in the tide, have the best opportunity to feed while expending the minimal amount of energy. One thing to pay attention to about these tides is as that tide progresses, you may be catching fish in a given area and then it kind of tends to dry out. My best piece of advice to give you is based on where the structure is down tide, try to slide your boat or, or get yourself into a position lower in the tidal area where those fish could have slid back to because as the tide pushes a little harder, the bait can get pushed further down. So don't just give up on an area, slide back, you know, do your drifts a little bit longer each time and try to cover that ground. Another thing to pay attention to is where does the tide get funneled? Where is it strongest, both on the outgoing or the incoming? If you look at some of the graphics I have here, some of these fish are gonna be stacked up on points where it makes a sharp turn, but there's a lot of tide coming through there. Any kind of elbow, any kind of break is gonna be a huge place that you wanna focus a lot of your energy and effort on. Last influence when it comes to tide is just paying attention to some of the other information you can get in. Have yourself networked. Uh, things you've noticed yourself, make a log. Social media creeping if that's, what you, if that's your thing. Whatever you gotta to do to get that piece of information. Bottom line though, despite what I tell you throughout this entire presentation or just on the tide, don't let your own knowledge or the knowledge you've built get in your own way. I can't tell you how many times fish have done what they want to do more than what we say they're going to do. So focus on the tides, try to find those breaks in those points, but don't be afraid to get outside the box as well. The last point on why current is key with these fish, again, comes down to how they relate to structure. In upper Narragansett Bay, I don't always have the luxury of large rock piles. It's usually going to be old wooden abutments, bridges, any kind of pieces of uh, man-made material like that, or it's something as simple as areas like I have here on a slide of the mouth of the Providence River. I have numbers there for years. And it's because it's a huge area where there's a huge exchange of, of, of water and nutrients. It's a large area where there's a heavy influence of incoming and outgoing tide, but it's basically got these positions that look like this, these sandy humps that create natural breaks in the bottom where the bass generally tend to move the most, especially along the edges of these shipping channels. Inversely, in the big water, we're not looking for that kind of sandy hump because you generally don't have it. There's so much tide and oceanic influence out there. We're looking for these. We're looking for these heavy rock piles. We're looking for big water structure. I know saying structure for bass seems kind of obvious, but those who know how to find the larger, more conspicuous rock piles where they relate to the heaviest points in tide are the ones that are catching the most and the biggest fish. 
One of the biggest things I learned about fishing current, I learned from steelhead fishing. Understanding how to make a bait naturally present itself as it normally would to these fish with current can have a big impact on the quality of the fish, the number of fish you catch. So it's important when you're thinking about targeting bass to try and think about how your baits are presenting to these fish. Am I weighting the bait heavily and just coming off the bottom and then drifting it over them? Or am I fishing lighter weight and am I allowing it to scope out and present to these fish to the structure they're holding on before they even get there. Both techniques can be effective, but both will require subtle changes in the rigging. So my general rule of thumb when I'm presenting the striped bass is to present my baits down tied to them. That is to say, they're sitting in there facing me and I'm bringing my bait to them. I'm not bringing it up over the top of their head and making it come in very unnaturally. They, they generally will want it to either kind of come across them and down or straight down to them with the tide. Uh, that being said, there are, you know, again, exceptions to that rule, but for the most part, you always want to try to make your baits present natural to them, whether they be a live bait getting bump trolled, whether it be an umbrella rig being trolled on wire, or whether it be something as simple as drifting a chunk, having a chunk weighted just up off the bottom, naturally drifting that to them, something that they would expect a presentation to come to them as. So in addition to the environmental factors like tide, moon, salinity, temperature of the water, uh, there's biospecific influences that can also have a huge impact on these fish and sometimes they'll actually override things like tide. You know, and that's one of those things where I tell you, sometimes I get on the water and I get out there to do that same program for 10 years and I just got to start from scratch every day. And those, those factors can be a number of things. It could be the migration time differently, so lots of fish are aggregated on together on the surface and they're feeding aggressively. There's not much you have to do to catch those fish. You probably could cast uh, a tin can into them and hook up. But there's other days where those fish are keyed in on something all day, you know, for a week, they're eating large menhaden, but they switch over all of a sudden because a crab hatch happens, or a worm hatch happens, or herring moved into the area. Or for whatever reason, the, the salinity change made the menhaden go deeper or higher or shallower. Point being, don't just stick to the rule of thumb on current, keep your mind open and understand that there's other biospecific influences like movements of bait or migratory patterns on these fish that can also drastically change their behavior in a day. Again, it's just one of the things that make these fish so amazing is the number of looks, the number of different fish a striped bass can be compared to other species. Striped bass eating. I mean, in general, a striped bass will eat all day. I mean, if an opportunistic meal is there or you're working your plug just right that it's agitating that fish and they're going to take a curiosity whack at it, striped bass are bullies. It's a simple fact. I mean, it, whenever you, if you've ever had the pleasure of watching a striped bass take an oversized topwater bait, you really get a good insight into the violence they're capable of. Uh, despite their normal feeding behavior in deeper water when they're a little more selective. They generally will hit a plug or they'll hit a bait to hurt it. You can tell that first strike is not to eat it, it's just to hurt it. And then sometimes they're almost malicious, they'll hit there two, three times more before they take it. And it's one of the reasons a lot of times when you're fishing treble hooked plugs that you hook these fish in the side of the face, mid body, the tail, under the chin, because they're walloping it before they turn around and they will eventually come back to eat it. But to understand striped bass feeding, they will eat throughout the day, but from my experience, striped bass tend to feed for about one hour per tide, and that is never the same. I wish I could tell you, get out there and fish the last hour of the incoming, but you know, all week I've had them do that, and then the next day they feed halfway through the tide. The point is, if you can go, go, and just keep learning from your experiences. Chances are, everyone that's watching this right now, I'd pick something up from. So the types of setups I use for striped bass changes throughout the season. Um, I do tend to bring both whenever I'm out because you never know when you're going to have to switch between live bait and artificial, but generally my year starts very technical, uh, backwater fishing, and I'm fishing much smaller stuff. I've got large, smaller bay anchovy, I've got very small herring around, um, squids, and the fish are keyed in on smaller baits, and they usually will range for me anywhere from 5 pounds to 30, and uh, they're swimming together, so you need gear that's capable of covering that kind of ground. Uh, I like a 4,000 class reel for those. This happens to be new Stella SW 4,000, but whatever's in your price range, whatever's in your, your wheelhouse, whatever you want to fish is going to be fine. But a 4,000 class reel, uh, this is a Loomis IMX Pro Blue. It's an 843. That three stands for the power in a Loomis. If you've ever looked at a Loomis rod, they're going to be generally rated between anywhere from a one to a five on, on the basic scale. More commonly in saltwater, you're going to see two to five power. Um, and the size power that I like to fish in the upper bay in the spring is about a three power. Uh, three power will cover you from anything from a 10 pound fish up to a 40 pound fish realistically. And because it's a little bit on the faster side, I can fish both 
light, smaller baits like a twitch bait, or I can throw larger spook lures like uh, dock lures or something along that line as well. I spool that up with basic Power Pro 30 green. I like it, it's a four carrier line. You can also go with a Max Quattro, or you can go with a Super Slick if you want something for a little bit more casting. Where I'm fishing, there's a lot of heavy timber, a lot of other stuff that I can rub up against on the rocks. I love a nice four carrier line like traditional Power Pro. This is basically the workhorse of my operation. This is a Shimano Northeast Series Terramar rod, and it's got a Shimano Funnus 8000 or a 6000 on it. I'll fish both, everything from a medium up to a medium heavy and I'll fish the seven foot and I'll fish the seven six in the heavier range. The reason I like this type of reel is it's literally a Swiss army knife of reels. I mean, there's nothing that it can't do. Uh, I'll throw plugs with this, large spooks. I can throw jerk baits with this, which is a predominant lure we tend to throw in the spring. But ultimately it becomes the most efficient bait rod I can fish. More so now that I actually will fish this reel over conventional. The reason I like to do that is I can do the snag and drop, which is just extremely popular with us now that the Menhaden have come back in some better numbers and we're not reliant on the herring since they're protected. Uh, the Menhaden has become a, a major food source and a major uh, influence on the way we fish for these larger fish up here in the Northeast. Uh, in addition to that, I have the bait runner option. So I, you know, I can snag and I can flip this bait into bait runner. But once I've acquired my baits and if I'm not interested in using the larger trebles and I want to switch over and take advantage of something like a circle hook where I'm going to have a much higher hookup ratio, I'll actually cut these off, I'll throw my leader on there, and I'll put on uh, a large circle hook, bridle rig a bait, or I'll just stick that bait you know, through the nose, and now I can bump troll or I can drift this. And what's nice about the bait runner feature compared to some of the conventional stuff that's out there is I can throw this in the bait runner, I can adjust and titrate the drag very specifically on it to put just the right amount of resistance on this fish if I'm bump trolling or if I'm drifting in a heavy tide, that that bait can't take that bait and run away unless a fish takes it. So there's a resistance on the bait. If the fish takes it, there's an, just enough give that it can still get away without feeling that resistance and won't drop it. But I'm not here just aimlessly allowing my bait to swim away. I have much more control and adjustability to that system. So the reason I like this type of setup is very durable. I can fish eels at Block Island with heavy lead with it. I can throw plugs with it and I can live line with it very effectively. Conventional setups can cover a lot of ground. Maybe you're, maybe you're fishing straight up and down vertically with live baits, or maybe you're taking advantage of some of the other extremely effective ways of catching these fish from boat. Maybe you're trolling wire, maybe you're trolling lead core. Uh, with wire, I like fishing the TLD reels. I just like a lever drag versus a direct engage, and I do not prefer a star drag on a reel. If I'm fishing lead core, I like using reels like the Dakota with a line counter where I can pay attention to both the color of the line and the amount of line I have out and keep a very consistent system when I'm trolling over these fish once I know the exact depth and speed I need to troll. Uh, but another advantage to trolling some of the bigger stuff in, in the water now is you can take advantage of using baits like uh, the Mojo Lure, for example. Mojos are these larger trolling weighted bucktail jigs, essentially, ball shape or, or bullet shape, and you can put these large shad bodies on them, but now you can actually get over these fish, troll them in heavy current, and use braided line on heavier setups. We actually have done it with larger heavy spinning reels, we've done it with conventional reels, and we've done it with jigging rods. We'll put them on grappler series or heavier quality rods that can sustain the heavy load of that bait without having to go to the traditional fiberglass uh, heavy rods like they would use a wire line. When it comes to bait for striped bass, again, where you are, what's available at the time will have a big influence on that. Maybe you've got live squid around, maybe you're fishing eels, maybe you're fishing shad. For us, it's mostly menhaden, scup. Um, and the further north you get, you'll actually see people also use mackerel as a regular part of that process. Uh, one of the things that's important about fishing these baits is where you hook them, how you hook them, and that's gonna come down to how you're fishing for them. If you're just allowing these fish to swim the traditional way for years and years has been nothing more than taking that hook and placing it in one nostril out the other or taking that hook and going right behind the head and just taking a pinch of the meat letting that bait swim away. Uh, live baits generally tend to be you know especially a nice fresh live bait they're rugged you can actually get a very minimal purchase. I actually find the less you bury a hook inside of a bait the better. Um, the old days of thinking you had to hide the hook in the bait is actually the worst thing you can do. It just puts a lot of meat and, and structure in between the gap of that hook and wherever you're trying to penetrate in that fish's mouth. So minimal amount of penetration with that hook inside the meat. One of the ways to do that very simply and, and still keep an effective purchase is to learn how to bridle rig. Um, bridle rigging is a lot easier than it looks. You know, it's nothing more than taking an open-ended needle, placing it through the nostrils or, or in that soft structure behind the nostrils on a fish, and then you pull a loop of a rubber band through, you have two loops, you take your hook, place it in the loops, twist it tight, and then push it one under time. And now you've got a very rigid, 
flexible connection to that fish without purchasing inside of the bait and it's going to allow that fish to move around. A larger bait fish can be eaten very easily by a bass and now you're going to be able to get a nice secure hook set on it without having to worry about any of that meat in the way. Uh, where you place the hook can matter. Uh, if I'm pulling on that fish a lot and I'm you know, not drifting, if I'm bump trolling or if I'm in such a heavy current that I'm pulling hard on that bait the whole time, I want that purchase in the front of that fish's face. I want to be able to influence the direction of that bait fish. But if I'm drifting, I actually prefer my bait to be hooked in the back, either behind the dorsal or right behind the head so that it can actually swim away from me very naturally and it feels the resistance of me and wants to leave the boat, wants to get away. And also having that hook mid bait, um, oftentimes if you're drifting versus bump trolling, there's usually a little bit of a dance. I talked about how striped bass like to feed where they pummel the bait before they take it. Um, you know, they give them a ride on their face all the way around the, the entire area, then they finally turn around, wallop it, and come in for a kill. Uh, having that hook mid bait can have a big influence on whether or not you hook up as well. If it's just in the head, many of you may have had that moment where that bass ran, bass ran, you set the hook, and then all you got back was a, a menhaden or a bait fish that had nothing but scale stripped off the back of it. That just means they're grabbing them from behind the way that bait's running. So on that drift, sometimes having that hook mid fish can uh, have a big difference. Also on the subject of live bait, if you do get to an area, if you're effective at aggregating or collecting a large amount of bait, whether you be sabiking mackerels, jigging up a bunch of small scups uh, within legal size range, or whether you're out there throwing a cast net for a school of menhaden, if you can get enough baits and you can sustain the quality of those baits in a well, uh, one of the coolest things you can do to really turn an area on, especially if the fish really aren't into it yet, is live chum. Um, and that is to take literally, and it might seem contra, you know, contraindicating to feed these fish before you get there. I've never seen it turn fishing off or ruin the chances. It only increases your chances to take literally netfuls or several of these baits, throw them in the water, and watch how they start getting predated on by bass. Bass will just really turn on the switch feeds. For years with uh, fly fishing clients, one of the things I would do is take a live fresh manhaden out of a well, let it swim up into an area I knew there were striped bass, and just having that that scent in the water would really turn them on. You know, I might have thrown a plug five, six, seven times. The fish would follow it, give me short looks, swirl at the boat. As soon as I threw that live bait in the water and then pulled it out, the next cast of the fly or the next cast of the spook was crushed. So, you know, use that bait to your advantage. Having that, that fresh scent and that live bait in the water as chum can be very effective. And now we can talk about dead baits. Um, the same, same exact baits, whether you're fishing squid, whether you're fishing mackerel, uh, fishing menhaden, the fresher the better. Now, I think that natural slime in the outside of the bait is extremely important. Um, it can definitely be a huge influence on whether or not you're effectively catching fish throughout the day. And chumming is key. If you're going to be fishing chunk baits, if you can get yourself into a position up tied of these fish, your choices are one of two things generally. Anchor up tied of a structure or a, or a break where these fish are going to hold, chum heavily, get those fish going in that chum and then sneak pieces of your baits into that, let them present naturally with minimal weight. Or the other option is to do a stem of the tide, which is one of my personal favorite ways of fishing. Um, it's bred a lot of different techniques, but generally you're gonna weight a chunk, whether you three weigh it, whether you high low it, whatever your method of getting a weight into this type of meat is. And you're gonna suspend that just up off the bottom, ideally at whatever height the striped bass are, get up tied to those fish and literally back with the tide on your boat, down with the tide, over these fish, present your baits exactly the same speed as the drift and you're gonna get really, really aggressive takes. Um, it's usually one or two bumps and then a smash or it's just a complete hammer because I like to tell my clients it looks like uh, when you feed goldfish in a cage, you know, in your, or in a terrarium, you drop a few flakes in, they come in, they suck it in, they spit it out a couple times, you'll feel that bump, 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 and then when they close their mouth on it, the rod tip will just bend straight to the water. So understanding how to present to these fish with chunks don't just drag it along the bottom where some of the trash fish might be. Um, really be cerebral about the process. You know, how does my bait look to these fish when I'm, when I'm presenting to them? Where are they relating to that structure and how can I make that look the most natural? Rigging for striped bass. Again, when it comes to striped bass, the, I think simple stupid is the best. Again, they're, they're an amazing fish. They're gonna throw you a lot of different looks, but I try to keep my rigging as simple as possible. One thing I do know about striped bass is they have a myriad of sensory in their face, uh, four nostrils. They never lose sense of smell. There's literally scent coming in one nostril and leaving the other behind it on both sides of their face at any given time. And they're very sensitive to electrical fields. They can pick up bait moving in complete darkness. Um, they're remarkable sensory on these fish. And one of the things that I have found is that less is more when it comes to hardware. So I'll give you an example. When I'm fishing in live baits in the upper bay, it's nothing more than light leader, 20 pound, 25 pound fluorocarbon directly to a circle hook. 
and I'm allowing that fish to swim. And all I've done is an FG, a PR, or a uni to uni knot to connect those baits. When I'm fishing deeper water fish, holding on structure like striped bass out at Block Island, uh, the trick we picked up together fishing years ago was to remove our hardware entirely. So instead of putting a three-way rig on there or something swivel to hold our, our lead to our bait, we would tie a uni knot to uni knot to attach our fluorocarbon to our braid. Only we would leave a long tag of our braided line. And then in turn, we would take that tag end of that braided line and do a series of half hitches to a sinker. That sinker is about one ounce per knot of tide. So if I have a two knot drift, that's a two ounce sinker. If I have a one knot drift, it's a one ounce sinker. And we generally would like to fish our baits just up off the bottom and drift directly over the top of the fish. Um, having that system there without all that extra metal clanging in the way just makes it look that much more natural and produces more fish for us. Inversely, if you're not fishing braid, there are many anglers out there who believe there's a harmonic to braid, especially when there's a lot of tide moving over, and you can feel that in the line as well. Uh, you do have the option to go lighter with, your mono, with a monofilament setup and fish much lighter uh, rubber core or egg sinkers or anything you want to allow that bait to present more naturally in the direction of those fish. And you can fish both sides of the boat on a drift that way effectively. One side's presenting your eel or whatever you happen to be drifting down tide directly to them before the boat gets there. The other drifts it directly over the top, most likely with a much longer leader to give you a pendulum and a more naturally presented bait. Just food for thought when it comes to rigging. Less is more. Um, I don't like to snell my circles. I like to use my Palomar knot to attach those. And I'll get into some of the rigging later with lures as well, uh, keeping things simple but effective. When I'm fishing artificial when it comes to rigging, again, I'm going to tie a knot that will go through the guides a little more effectively. For me personally, that's an FG knot. Uh, you may like to use in the Alberto knot, Bristol knots, improved Bristol. Um, the uni to uni knot that we use live bait fishing generally has a much larger profile because it's a jam knot and it will click and make a lot of noise and, and can if affect your casting if you're casting aggressively. So I do suggest learning knots like a PR bobbin or an FG or an Alberto knot, something that you're going to be comfortable tying you know, when your hands are cold or in the dark, whatever works for you, but something that will pass through the guides. If you find you are having trouble and you're chafing a lot with any of your knots, shorten your leader slightly. A lot of people I find tie much longer leaders, leaders than they need to. And one of the ways to keep that length on your leader is a simple system of connecting at the base of that, especially if you're like in a spring fishery where you're going to be changing lures out from small profile to large profile, subsurface to surface, and you're basically just throwing a lot of looks at them until you find out what they want that day. And the way to do that effectively traditionally was a snap swivel. But snap swivels offer a lot of hardware. They can change the balance of the bait. They can affect the action a lot. In the big world of bluefin tuna running gun style fishing, uh, years back, anglers figured out that we could take barrel swivels, attach a large split ring to the front of them, and that would allow us this nice quick change system without having the frailty of the torsion or any kind of leverage on the snap of a snap swivel. Well, striped bass, even though they're not as big or powerful as a tuna, they are capable of extremely violent bursts of energy, and they too can open a lot of swivels and get themselves into positions with rocks or structure that they can pop them open. And again, these baits and these lures are slightly smaller than we'd be throwing for tuna, so one of the ways we get around that is to do one of two things. You can use a fast clip um, or some kind of paper clip looking style attachment, but I kind of like a little less hardware. So what we've done is we've taken a solid ring and we tie our line to a solid ring. And then to that solid ring, we attach a small split ring. And then we use that split ring essentially as a snap swivel. So this split ring can now be attached to any lure I want. I'm not cutting my, my leader back every time I change out my plug and end up with a, you know, a six inch leader by the time I figure out what they want to eat. So it's an effective means of doing it. The only time I'll cut and retie is after a solid fish. Um, I will feel my line. If it looks like it's been stretched, if there's any kind of chafe on that leader, then I will change it out. Uh, and always look above your leader as well. A lot of times that chafe doesn't happen on your leader, but it can happen on your braid up above it. So uh, that's the only scenario where I'll actually prefer to cut and retie. We'll talk lures real quick. Again, this is a subject that if you can find two striper guys that agree on, you know, I'm impressed. There's a lot of nuances. Again, I told you these fish mean so many different things to so many different people, and it's remarkable how many different ways they can give you looks. Uh, again, you might be throwing to small fish inside of a back, backwater eddy. You may be throwing to big fish in heavy surf, or maybe you're just trying to target them deep. Uh, lure fishing for me, for the most part, except for when fish are migrating along Block Island or along Rhode Island and Connecticut South Shore, I'm generally focusing in bay type environments. Um, and we have fish to 50 pounds that'll take top waters in these bay type environments. But we get a lot of different looks, and we have to adjust that every single trip, it seems. You know, they may be keyed in on one bait over another. 
So it, for me, it comes down to basically three types of presentations for striped bass. I'm fishing a subsurface jerkbait, and that range can size you know, all over the place, but I'm generally going to be matching herring. I'm going to be matching um, small sand eels. I'm going to be matching silver sides, bay anchovy, uh, baits like a colt sniper jerk, or even baits like a jackal re-range. Uh, smaller fish, I'll leave these hooks on. Uh, larger fish, I actually will drop the middle treble and put two larger trebles on here. Um, the difference between these two baits, the Colt Sniper Jerk is going to swim down. We give it, generally will give that a few cranks, two pulses, and it's usually on that second pulse you get whacked. It'll float back up a little, we crank it back down. Baits like a Rearrange are actually going to sink slightly on their own and stay neutrally buoyant. So you can actually give very small chops, then a steady retrieve, very small chops, and it basically will swim down and then just throw a lot of flash. When the fish are real subtle, when they're swirling a lot and they're not quite keeping up with a more aggressive bait like a Colt Sniper Jerk, that's where baits like a Rearrange really shine. They get smoother and slower than that is when we switch over to something even more natural, we go to a plastic. And again, if they're eating herring, if they're eating shad or menhaden, something large, we'll throw big large plastics. Sometimes we'll hand pour our own, sometimes we'll use other brands that we can find. Uh, and then they may be on smaller baits, they may be on clam worms, they may be on sand eels. And that's where something with a smaller profile, a little more lifelike action can have a big influence on them. My favorite way to catch these fish, hands down, just because they're bullies, is watching it. I like seeing them on top water. It's almost always effective in deep water or shallow. Um, and it's remarkable the size I use. You know, when, the, when they first, first come in in the spring, I'm using tiny stuff. I'm using Colt Sniper Twitch. I'm using Colt Sniper uh, walks. I'm using little orca pops, you know, small stuff, and, and big fish will take them. It's remarkable how big of a fish will take some of these smaller presentations, but the best that happens is when the bigger baits come in. When the large menhaden are in, when the fish start getting competitive, especially once the bait kind of stabilizes in certain regions and the fish are more holding to structure and, and being more affected by tide and temperature, I like throwing big topwater stuff. Uh, docks, large Daddy Max spooks, um, HD Orca is stuff that you can make a lot of commotion on the surface with, with a huge profile, uh, and just watch these fish come up and they're going to hammer them three, four times. What I found that's most important with any of these types of baits when you're throwing them is the cadence is key. Uh, I really like a two-part cadence on all of them. Uh, HD Orca, I'll actually put the rod tip in the water, something a trick I learned, and just reel, and it'll swim a lot, and then I give it two sharp sweeps, okay? And this, is, this one's almost on the surface and slightly sub, it'll dip between the two. Larger baits, docks, spooks, whatever you want to do, homemade wooden plugs that are going to walk the dog wide for you. I like a two-part repeated cadence. Walk, 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 walk. And it's usually on that second walk, a little bit of a pause in between. And, it, and you're going to change your speeds with this. You know, go extremely slow or go extremely fast with it. And eventually you're going to find you're going to hook up with these fish. But the most important thing with either of them I've found is remember you're not smallmouth fishing in some back lake. Throw water. Okay. Next time you're throwing a topwater plug, watch it have its action. Then try to repeat that action, but throw water. So throw water left, throw water light, right. You know, have that cadence, but make that movement. And it just seems to produce that, that aggressive instinct in the bass with that pause once it's thrown the water better. And just adjusting that little bit of the cadence can make a big difference. Again, remember I said bass like to hurt this stuff. So just because you get blown up on and miss it, don't, you know, ah, oh, he missed it keep that cadence. In fact, one of the things I learned fishing overseas was to make my bait injured once it got hit. So I'll work a plug in a certain cadence, okay? And then when that fish misses it or hits it, I'll actually chop the rod tip and reel very slowly and make the, fit, the bait seem injured and pause it and make it seem injured and pause it over and over again. And a lot of times that'll produce a strike on a fish that just keeps kind of muckling it and doesn't go for the take. Um, does it work all the time? No, but it's something else to add to your arsenal that maybe you didn't think of before. Once it gets hit, injure your bait, retrieve your bait effectively that way. One thing I will say is I generally tend to like low pitch rattles over high pitch for striped bass. Smaller fish will hit high pitch, but the larger fish do tend to like the low pitch stuff. Uh, when you are throwing your baits, I want you to think of a couple different things. Am I going from shallow to deep or am I coming from deep to shallow? It's ideal to come off of a ledge from sh shallower water to deeper unless you have, you're just on a flat. But try to make sure that when you are fishing your bait, it's going with the tide, like I said. Make sure that that bait lands in an up tide position and just like the steelhead or just like I said with these striped bass, make sure it's walking with the tide toward the fish the way they're expecting that bait to come to them. I mean, if the fish are up schooling on live baits, one thing you may want to try to do is get yourself, it, this is the one exception to the rule, if they're pushing into the tide, for example, and they're all marauding, 
get yourself ahead of the fish, make sure your plug lands in front of those fish and is running away from them naturally. Uh, one of the presentations I give on tuna fish, and I always make a point about, you know, if a lion was laying there and a rabbit charged a lion, the lion would jump and, and move back. It's not much different mentally for these fish or any bass or tuna. Uh, you want to plug the land in front of it and run away from it. That's, that's going to instinct, natural prey instinct, uh, prey drive versus having a plug land and run at the fish. That's not very natural presentation wise. And you're probably less likely to hook up that way than you would if you had your bait land and run away. Another thing about angle of baits, uh, something I picked up from fellow Shimano pro staffer and uh, pro staff manager Blaine Anderson was just paying attention to the color of the, of the sun on the baits and in the shadow presented. If you're in a position where the fish has to run at your bait and your back is to the sun, now that fish is actually looking into the sun to try and find your plug. And that carries through to trolling bars for tuna, you name it. Uh, you generally want your baits to have the sun uh, coming at them off the side or you want the sun on the back of the bait. You don't want the fish staring at the sun while it's coming to approach it. Okay, so if you can adjust your angle slightly so that when the fish is chasing your plug, it's not staring directly into the sunlight, it can also have a big influence on their efficiency of hitting the bait. Now that twilight hour is a weird hour for bass versus feeding in the dark. So if, in case you haven't been able to figure it out yet, you know, I'm a big fan of the species of striped bass. I've been fortunate in my career to travel all over the world and take on a lot of different game fish. And to this day, there's slim to none I would ever take over a striped bass. Because a striped bass, I can go experience that fish in 20 different ways just in my own home state. You know, if I feel light tackle, if I feel like fly, if I feel like deep water, if I want a chunk, it doesn't matter. If I fish from the beach, if I fish from a dock, they're just a special fish, we're lucky to have them. And again, I, I just believe they should be our national fish. Speaking to that, you know, we want to take care of these resources. Uh, they're a remarkable game fish. And over the years, we've become more and more protective of them, rightfully so. And one of the things that I've learned, um, I'm a big photographer, I'm into it, you know, love it or hate it. My style of shooting has always been a grip and grin style shot. Well, that means taking the fish out of the water. And if you're gonna do that, you need to minimize that amount of time. You almost wanna think of, when you take that fish out of the water, hold your breath. That's about the amount of time you generally wanna hold that fish out of the water for. One of the ways to get around handling the fish, getting the camera ready and getting for that shot as opposed to just netting it onto the deck and leaving it there until you're ready is to use a lip grip style tool. I think they're great. Um, some of the better captains I've fished with over the years have used bogas and if you've got deep enough water for that, that's good. When I'm fishing in the upper bay areas or in some of the shallower water, I don't want to send that fish down into the mud with a heavy boga on it. So smaller, heavy, um, you know, rugged plastic lip grips, you actually just attach this to the lip of, or the jaw of the striper and then we'll have these little tethers attached to a leash and now we can allow that fish to literally just swim as if it were on a stringer that did no damage to it next to the boat, get our camera ready, get ready to compose and personally I think the new lifting the fish straight up out of the water right there shot's great but you do have enough time to get it up, get your shot, get it back in the water. Remember now there's a slot limit on these fish, uh, you, know, you don't want to retain this fish under any, any circumstances are going to put you in trouble with the law and it's just better for us all overall. You know, the better this fishery gets again, the better it will be for all of us.